In September of last year, I moved into a tiny house cabin that was on the edge of a national forest outside of Asheville. The place was pretty small and spartan, so I had to be deliberate with how I furnished it. I filled the cabin with items that had practical use or meant a lot to me and reflected my personality. The cabin was really cozy, and the late summer months felt like a dream. The late summer was a gold mine for mushroom foraging. The frequent rains allowed an abundance of mushrooms of all sorts and varieties. I found this tree flush with mushrooms after encountering some rambunctious bears along the way. A couple days later, I found this gorgeous specimen of beefsteak fungus. It was red on the top and bubblegum pink on the bottom. It looked like a tongue sticking out of the oak tree. It is one of the few safe mushrooms to eat raw, so I had a few nibbles on the trail. A few feet away I found a beautiful bunch of honey mushrooms growing on a nearby oak. These mushrooms like to form fairy rings around trees, encircling them growing out of the roots and at the base of the tree. The mushrooms grow in thick clusters because they are part of one mycelium network under the ground. One honey mushroom colony in Oregon is the largest organism in the world, spanning several miles under the ground. I like to saute the caps of these mushrooms, and then I'll take the stalks and bake them like french fries. For the younger specimens like these, I cook them whole or use them in soups. Honey mushrooms are often very abundant and can be gathered quite easily. After a good rain in honey mushroom season, I'll often bring home one to two pounds in a single hike. Chicken of the Woods is another classic wild edible mushroom. As the name suggests, it makes a great chicken substitute in any meal. You want to harvest these before uh, they get too hard and tough. Indigo Milkcap is one of the most vibrant mushrooms in the forest. The mushrooms are a vibrant indigo blue and exude a milky substance when they're cut or bruised. The mushrooms are edible, but they're not my favorites. I just eat them occasionally to have something colorful on my plate. As the months got colder, I had to spend more time processing firewood. I tried to cut and split any downed hardwoods I found around. I have a very small wood stove in the house, it's the size of a tent stove, but luckily my house is pretty small, so it warms it up nicely. I had to put together a new bed frame for my cabin, since my old queen size bed wouldn't fit in the, uh, in the room, I had to get a twin size bed. This bed frame is a very simple a uh, twin size kit made of tulip poplar, but I want to add in birch posts from the forest as well as a headboard, probably made out of tulip poplar as well, just to customize it a little bit. We got this bear quilt right here. This bear quilt with little mushroom mushrooms engraved into the quilt as well. And then the back side, we got little mushrooms, bears, and then also little t shirts that I had as a kid.
I have a pretty good collection of foraging plant and mushroom books, which I'll talk about at the end of the video, and a little picture of myself at five years old. Archery is one hobby I like to practice in my free time. I'm not the best at it, but I gotta practice my bow and arrow skills for my mushroom hunts. They require a lot of precision in hunting those wild beasts. Sweet birch bark is an herb I've grown to love lately. The inner bark of the sweet birch tree has a nice wintergreen flavor and smell. The herb has been used to reduce inflammation in the body as well as relieve pain. The bark contains salicylic acid, which is the main compound of aspirin. I'm gathering this bark for a new tea blend that is available on my shop. It combines sweet birch bark, black cherry bark, chicory, and tulsi. And together they work as a really good cold weather tea, helps supporting the lungs and reducing inflammation in the body. Wood carving is another hobby I like to do in my spare time. I'm not terribly good at it, but it's so satisfying to make a utensil or a cup out of a piece of wood. Here I'm trying to make a classic Kuska cup from a piece of Tula poplar. Eventually I want to hand carve enough utensils, plates, and bowls to replace all my current utensils from the store. In early December, winter came to the cabin. In western North Carolina, winters are fairly mild, but we get a little bit of snow, and it can get pretty cold at night. So to make sure I had enough wood again, to stay cozy and warm through the cold temperatures. Today we're going to be talking about a few different foraging books that will help you along your plant and mushroom journey. First up we got a gently used copy of A Field Guide to Mushrooms of the Carolinas. Now this one I throw into my backpack all the time when I go hiking, so it's I've ruffled a few feathers, let's say. But this book covers every single mushroom species that we know so far that is in North Carolina and South Carolina. Obviously this book will be also relevant to surrounding areas like Tennessee or Virginia, even Georgia. In the book, you have your pictures, your description, whether the mushroom is edible or not, and key identification um, tools. Now what I like about this one is that the pictures and the description are, are together. Another mushroom book that's good to have is the National Audubon Society Guide to Mushrooms. This covers every mushroom in North America. So it's good to have specific books on your region, like in my case, Carolina, North Carolina. Um, and then also have one for like North America too, just as backup. The one thing I don't like about this book is you have your pictures in the front and then this, the description for the uh, mushroom is in a completely different place in the back. So you kind of have to flip back and forth which is kind of a pain when you're in the field and trying to identify something relatively quickly. But this goes into detail, tells you how big the caps are, what the spore print color should be, and all the information you'll need to identify the mushrooms in the field. Next up we got Ancestral Plants by Arthur Haynes. Now this book focuses on plants, on the edibility, medicinal uses, and also primitive skills uses. So if you want to find out which wood is good for bow drills, 
when's the best time to harvest goldenrod to make a hand drill, and also which plants are edible, what their medicinal uses are. This goes into all of it. It goes into more detail than you'd usually find in a normal field guide. It has a lot of scientific information as well as practical primitive skills use information. Um, so I'd highly recommend this one. This guy is located in Maine, so it's largely northeastern species, but it also corresponds to other regions like the southeast, the midwest. Not all the information will be applicable to your area. Another great one is Medicinal Plants of the Southern Appalachians. This book covers 45 plants that have medicinal use in the Appalachian region. Um, it has no pictures, so it, this one it wouldn't be very good for identifying, um, but it, it gives a lot of good information about like, when's the best time to harvest a specific plant, what's the best usage, um, how to make teas, how to make tinctures, how to make salves. So this has a lot of information for an herbalist, but I definitely recommend having another guide to actually identify the plant. Another great book series is by Samuel Thayer. He's written three books so far, and they go into extreme detail on a number of plants. This book far exceeds the normal information you'll find in a field guide, often devoting five to even 50 pages on a single plant. And he'll talk about anecdotes from his childhood, specific information describing the plants, when to harvest, recipes you can use the plant in, whether it actually tastes good or not, because some some plants and mushrooms are edible, but they're not really that good tasting. So just because you can eat something doesn't mean it's good to eat, you know? This book has amazing photography of all the plants in the book. Several pictures for each plant, so it's really easy to reference in the field. And maps of where the range of the plant is. So this is the most detailed and specific um, plant book that I know of. He only covers like 30 to 36 plants in every book, but it's well worth it. You really feel like you know the plants. Lastly, we have Southeast Foraging. This is part of a regional series on foraging throughout the United States. This one focuses obviously on the southeastern region. Uh, this is a pretty good basic field guide to plants in the area. It has one picture for each plant and a solid amount of information to identify and figure out when to harvest and how to preserve the plants. So this is another one that's good to have on the bookshelf. So that's all for foraging resources that I have to share. Leave a comment down below if you think there's one I should know about. I'll have a video on different late winter and spring edibles coming out in the next month or so. But until then, happy foraging.